Yes, what a beautiful day today. And another opportunity for us to look unto Jesus this afternoon. Uh, under this phrase, the fullness of time. Uh, let's pray. Dear gracious Father, we pause one, once again just to remind ourselves that we are dependent upon you to help us understand and apply to our experience today that which you have so liberally given us. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher and our guide, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This phrase comes from Galatians, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Pretty special thing that God has done for us, isn't it? That after the loss of uh, the divine estate for this globe, that he would make an effort to correct the problem. The instructions were pretty clear. You know, I give you everything. Just one little thing I'm asking you to stay away from, and that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But, as you know, that's not what happened. You kind of wonder, you know, so God made that statement, and he put that test there, from the human standpoint, we would say, well, you had your chance. And we could think that God, in his sovereignty, should follow through. And that would have been it. But God being love, that's not how it has gone. And we can be so grateful. He's been so merciful. We don't deserve it. And so, God's timetable is beyond us to understand. I think the, the whys and wherefores that it takes the, the amount of time that it does from our perspective in terms of humanity. You know, we have time and eternity. We live in time, and God inhabits eternity. And this thing of time is a frustrating thing to us. We only have so much of it. And we hope that as we come to the end of our time, whenever that may be, that we have things right with the judge of all the earth. So here we are to contemplate the fullness of time. Now, this was a, a place in time, in this context in which we live, it is a biblical expression, as I've read here. It comes from uh, the Apostle Paul's words here. It reminds us that God does have a timetable. And we read about various aspects of his timetable throughout the Scripture. He's very specific about his time. There are aspects about his specificity that we perhaps don't understand, and for sure, we have not respected. I mean, that's obvious through um, just the hallowing of the seventh day as sacred time. Humanity has completely disregarded that aspect of what God said would be a special period of time for uh, humankind. This particular fullness of time mentioned here in Galatians 4 is uh, something that was established long before the world was created. It goes way back into time immemorial. And it was designed before there ever was a problem, before, before this world ever got close to needing help. It was designed with the potential for sin in mind. And so it says the fullness of time came and when that happened 
a unique event happened on this world. There are some great markers of divine events. When we look back over the history of the world, one of them is uh, the fall of our parents, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But this is another one. There was, of course, the flood of Noah's time. But this particular fullness of time is one of the most astounding aspects of time on earth as God had it in his hands, in his care. And we want to look at the dynamics of coming up to this and coming through this period of time. Satan had been at work for a long time to uh, interrupt what he saw was going to be God's attempt to retrieve man's brokenness. We read here in The Desire of Ages that the fullness of time had come. Humanity had become more degraded through the ages of transgression such that it called for the coming of the Redeemer. Satan had been working to make the gulf deep and impassable between earth and heaven. Now notice this. It was his purpose to wear out the forbearance of God and to extinguish his love for man so that he would abandon the world to satanic jurisdiction. Can you imagine such a thing? He wasn't just fighting against God. He wasn't just an antagonist, he, just somebody constantly in, in war with God. He had a purpose, and that purpose was to get God to give up on this planet, to abandon the world to satanic jurisdiction. You know, the uh, entertainment media has put together probably thousands of things to delight the senses and cause people to be fearful and horror-stricken. Uh, there's a whole genre of movies, you know, for that. It's interesting what the human mind tries to conceive and come up with. And in this context of this world we live in, where there is this great conflict between good and evil, but the unconverted mind even postulates what some of this satanic jurisdiction would look like. Isn't it interesting? And then to feast on it as entertainment. And that's the work of the satanic mind, to infuse humanity with that same kind of thinking. But for humanity and its entertainment, it's make-believe. And yet, what foolishness. That's exactly what Satan had in mind. That he would turn the course of, course of humanity in such a way that it would be everything that humanity would fear and tremble before. So isn't it, isn't it a, a, an interesting thing that Humanity in its unconverted state finds pleasure in the observance of that which in reality would destroy them with fear. This was Satan's plan. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. We lost that. And he was going to give it back. Amazing love. Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. Uh, this, uh, this coming of the Son of Man to our world at the time he did was not just um, 
or something that God was going to do sometime down in time. It was planned out. And there were, th <clears throat> there were things that God was doing in relationship to uh, the play and counterplay of the development of nations and the movements of mankind over the, over the globe. There was nothing about 4,000 years of history that was not under the very watchful eye of God as he saw everything that Satan was doing to corrupt the mind of man. But it was on God's timeline. I don't think... I'm quite convinced after what I've studied and read here about the fullness of time coming with the manifestation of the Messiah, I'm very convinced that even Satan didn't know what was in the mind of God about what he was up to in the redemption of this, of this world, of our lives. This subject, in my mind, is so deep, it's so full, it's so rich, God's earliest provisions for our need. Look at them. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the revelation of the mystery. The mystery. It's a mystery what God was out, uh, uh, about. According to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Provision was made for us. You know we have in the Advent movement this concept, and I believe that it's true, that the Lord could have come ere this. Aren't those words that we know from the pen of inspiration? So all of us in this room today, technically speaking, uh, could not have been here because he would have come ere this and we would not have been a part of that picture. Now that, of course, can spin off some crazy ideas in your thinking, I know. But did God not know that we were going to be here? That there would be a delay and you and I would be here and we would have the privilege, <laughs> the absolute glorious privilege be, to be included in this marvelous thing of the redemption of the earth? and all that that would bring to the universe beyond. It didn't take God by surprise. He provided for, for you and me, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. I don't know how God does things like that. That kind of knowledge, is, as the Scriptures say, is too wonderful for me, in a good sense. Christ, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, that your faith and hope might be in God. Manifest for you. What a wonderful thing. How God has spoken in these last days. I think that's an interesting expression of Scripture, isn't it? And we say, well, in, in these last days. Well, let's see. That's Hebrews 1. Okay, so that book was written 2,000 years ago. What did it say? In these last days spoken unto us by his Son. You see the, the juxtaposition of God's concept of, uh, of time and our expectation and our sense of time and our sense of these last days. When we say these last days today, we're thinking of the time in which we live, not 2,000 years of time. Does that suggest something to us also about the greatness of time? And that yes, in fact, when this was written, it's as timely today as it was written in 2,000, in 2000 years ago. Because the plan was from time immemorial. Well, we shouldn't stumble over the phrase. And his son whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. <laughs> For us, purged our sins. You can just, can't you see him sitting down with his father finally and saying, look what we have done. Look where we're going with this. The enemy has been defeated. What was the earth's condition in the fullness of time? At that time, the scripture refers to here. Well, it was dark, it says. Servant of the, servant of the Lord writes these words. The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. Misapprehension of God. People were... They didn't know what to think of God. They were afraid of God. That, that the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority, only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. Notice that, in contrast. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height, the depth of the love of God could make it known. And so upon the world's dark night the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. I'm given to understand by this reference and others that will follow that was what, what was happening over the ages from the fall of Adam and down through those pre-flood years and then the post-flood years down to the very time of Jesus that what was happening was an increasing increasing um, commandeering of the earth by Satan to control and to debase and to destroy. It wasn't just that man had fallen and that Satan was around as a tempter. No, no, it was more than that. Satan was on the track year by year by hundreds of years to make it worse and worse in the mind and hearts of men and women and children. And I don't know about you, but today, as we understand that in these last days, and I speak of our time now, right here, 2019, that in these last days, we can feel and we can sense the Holy Spirit starting to back up. Can you not? Yes. Both in the world and in the church. We're feeling that withdrawing of the Spirit of God. We have but little time left to make our calling and election sure with God. We need to be doing as the old pioneers did. Morning and evening. Lord, please send my sins beforehand to judgment. Only those who are weeping between the porch and the altar, as it says. Only those who are crying and sighing for the abominations done in the land. And by the way, there's one reference that I've found in the spirit of prophecy where the servant of the Lord supplies church in the place of land. Do you know where that is? Most some of you do third volume of the testimonies. I think it's 257 or something like that. Abominations done in the church. And another reference that says that if we are not connected with that concept and understand what it means to sigh and to cry for the abominations done in the church, we'll be left out of the picture. That we want to understand that we want to know. But only 
By love is love awakened. And um, this work only Jesus could do. And we're so thankful that he has done such a fabulous job. Now, the world was ripe for his appearing in, in an, and I'll just go quickly through these, in a number of reasons or a number of ways. There was one government, one language. There was this emptiness in the human heart. There's a lot of emptiness in the human heart today. There is a reference, I believe it's in the Desire of Ages, that it speaks of, and we're coming up here on some of these things about demonic possession. The world was rife. In, in the place that Jesus came to in the Middle East there in Palestine, demons were in people everywhere. Um, I read here again in Mark 1, three or four references in just one chapter where Jesus was commanding the demons to go out of people. And, and it says many, many, they'd come and many people were brought to him. And he would command them and he wouldn't let them speak. And they had to respond, they had to go. There's an emptiness in the human heart then and there is now today. Prophets outside of Israel were predicting the Messiah. It's an, it's an interesting thing that back in that day, uh, there were people in different parts of the world that had been studying and looking into the sacred writings of different groups, I suppose. It doesn't tell us completely. It doesn't define everything for us. But that in, uh, in particular, in relationship to the Jewish religious economy, philosophers, seekers for truth, outside of Israel, by the scores were looking into these things, trying to find the truth, and they were approaching people in the Jewish nation to get more information on this. And because of the bigotry and this attitude of the Gentile being no better than a dog, that they didn't want to be contaminated and they didn't want to talk and visit with somebody, that they held this to themselves. And the very knowledge that God had given them to bless the world became a curse to them. A few broke through. A few came into the picture in Israel. And we see that in those philosophers from the east that showed up there in Jerusalem. And we're told that many of the others who were out there somewhere seeking for the truth and hoping to have some connection with those who had been made the depositories of divine truth, actually gave their lives in search of that truth, and they never got it. What a horrible, what a horrible legacy as a nation to leave behind, that you so held that to yourself and controlled it, that the people that really wanted to know couldn't have it but they gave their lives as martyrs trying to get it. And God spoke through nature. He spoke through types and symbols, patriarchs and prophets. And Satan had degraded humanity through the spread of heathenism. Sorry for the slide there. I guess it's uh, not going to all be on the screen, but... Sin had become a science, and vice was consecrated as a part of religion. It got worse, and it got worse. How bad was it? We have some picture of it here. and We have to slow down and take it a little bit more measured to get a sense of it. The deception of sin had reached its height. All the agencies for depraving the souls of men had been put in operation. The Satan is at work. He's, he has a concerted effort. How many angels does he have to work on a project like this? We have no idea. We say a third. But we have no idea of the billions of God's creation. Satanic agencies were incorporated with men. What does that mean? 
Well, it explains it a little bit. The bodies of human beings had become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, I thought that was interesting. The nerves, the passions, the organs of men. Mankind, men and women, children were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgence of the vilest lust. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenance of men. Human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Now, that's a description of what was. And I wished I had put it in here, but there is a statement there in the Desire of Ages also says that today, today, it's ten times worse than it was then. Have you read that? That's the most interesting statement. That the demonic influence in humanity today is ten times worse. And it may not be just in the features of the face and, the, you know, the expression, etc., How many ways does the evil one have to work his trade upon human, uh, the human psyche and the, and the soul? Uh, it's, it's almost, to us, it would be almost endless, I'm sure. Consider this. He's been at this for how long? 6,000 years? And the one that's on your track... I don't want to scare you with this, but just, just to think, to put some perspective to this. You're going to live your three score and ten, hopefully. And if you do, as soon as you're, uh, as soon as you're done with the three score and ten and you go to your rest, the one that's been on your track, he's going to be a, assigned to another one. Now, before he was assigned to you, how many generations before you did he have for others that he worked with down through the centuries? Does, do these creatures know human nature? Do we have any idea how they can look at who we are? We say, well, they can't read our minds. Thankful for that. That's little comfort for what they know about it just looking at. Just standing here looking at me, what they might read out of me is a scary thought. Now, it would be totally horrific and frightful if I didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior and to be my sustainer. And what have we read in the Desire of Ages? That if the devil had his way, he would kill every little bird that flies in the sky, that rests in the tree. He would destroy everything, everything that brings happiness and joy to human beings. And when he deceives someone, here's something else for us to think about in terms of the malevolency and the evil, the pure evil. When he destroys people's faith and causes them not to come close to God or to turn away if they've been there, he not only is happy that now they are uh, out of faith and out of religion and going away from God, but now he gleefully tortures them. The enemy of our souls is great, but the Lord Jesus is greater. Praise God for that. And so over the centuries, and uh, we mentioned this yesterday, yesterday but the, the history of Israel, by the time we come to the fullness of time, the fullness of time, when Jesus came onto the scene as a babe, by that time, Israel has already had 1,500 years of history. Think about that. This fair country that we live in, our independence from Britain, 1776. How long is our history? As wonderful as it's been, we've had some tragedies, civil war, etc. But it's a wonderful place to live, don't you think? Amen. Overall. Yeah. 
And how much time have we had? So 18, 19, you know, two or three hundred years. Two or three hundred years. Israel, the chosen of God, 1,500 years. And here's what Satan's been at work trying to do. And he accomplished his mission. That's a horrible thought, isn't it? He accomplished his mission with God's people. Uh, and what correspondence? I like what I was hearing this morning. Is there a correspondence? There's always a correspondence, isn't there? From ancient to modern. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God, but he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel by com contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. Note the word there, corrupt. And then that sentence, so it was with Israel. That's where they were. And Jesus comes into this. And now you understand why there was such intense conflict between Jesus and the ruling class, the leadership, religious leadership, confessors of faith. Down there in Capernaum, Jesus is preaching. He's preaching about the beauties of the kingdom of God. And an evil one sitting in the con congregation can't take it anymore. He just can't hold it down anymore, and he rises up, begins shouting and carrying on. And the people immediately recognize an unbridled demon in a human being. And Jesus simply commands, and he has to be quiet. And he has to come out of the man. And how, how many hundreds of times scenes like that were repeated and off to the side, out in the country, that scene was repeated over and over as human beings habitated by devils met the Savior and had to give way. But this is what humanity had come to. What would it have been like to live back then and uh, run into some of those folk? You know, there are, there are certain places where this is more manifest in society. We don't see it a lot here in America. Go to some other countries. And we see more of it. Now, it is here. It is here. And anytime someone takes a gun and shoots up a synagogue or a church or any place of gathering where people are, those are demons. Those are demons in human beings. We, we need this... As Christians, we can see what that is. Now, the world out there does not confess it that way. I have an article in my file by a psychiatrist who's taking his, this was some years ago, he's taking some of his colleagues to task, saying, um, I'm wondering, my friends in the psychoanalytic business and the psychological business and the psychiatric field, have we um, kind of shunted something to the side that we don't want to deal with? When we get into these areas of schizophrenia and people hearing voices and so on and so forth and other things other than that too. I thought it was rather interesting that this uh, worldly psychiatrist is saying, hmm, there's something in there we don't quite understand. I had that even in my own course, Washington, Eastern Washington University, when I was um, for a little while there taking a little leave from ministry just for some mental health self-care. You know, that's a good thing to do from time to time. And uh, so I went sideways and took a course in, uh, in counseling, clinical counseling, and, and I had a, a professor. I had heard of these stories. I never thought that I would be the uh, in one of them. But he comes into the classroom the first day. He's teaching uh, Counseling 101 or something like this. 
he comes in a huge long blackboard as long as this side wall here and he takes a piece of chalk and he starts writing at one end of the board in gray big letters there is no no capital truth big T there is no big T truth turns around looks at the class puts these books down that was his opening statement to the class there's no big T truth there is no absolute truth and I thought to myself okay you're a pastor sitting in here with all these 20 year olds and you're 55 and so what's this gonna look like you know down the road here a few weeks in class how's this gonna go so the next day I come into class and there's nobody there yet I was early I'm I hate to be late I've been late to supper here a few times but <laughs> I hate to be late so I came in early sat down over against the wall he's busying himself with his materials up front that he's going to teach from and he has these big glasses horn rim glass on he looks up and he sees I'm the only one in the room and he looks over there and he sees where I'm at and he says oh well so who are you I introduced myself. And he said, oh, well, <laughs> he says, I haven't been religious for a long time. But he says, whatever floats your boat. And I thought, well, that's pretty magnanimous, magnanimous of him. I thought, oh, that'll do. I'll get along OK then, probably. Well, so we were assigned our projects. And uh, I was assigned with uh, three or four of these young people. And we had a project that we were going to do. And, our project, we were going to pre do a presentation, a, a slide presentation, and all of the inf nice information. I thought, boy, it's nice to be in a group of kids like this because they know all about the technology. They'll put this thing together. We'll just sail on through this, you know, which they did. And our project was Carl Jung. <laughs> all about him, you know. And. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you know anything about him, he was into spiritualism and he was into dreams and all kinds of stuff, you know. And, and he, was, he was one of these guys that went around the world and collected stuff from all kinds of philosophies to bring in and put into his, his modality for uh, psychoanalytics and um, psychiatry, etc. So we did our presentation and we were done and the class all dismissed itself, but our little group was standing around and the prof comes over and he says, you guys did really good. And somehow, right there, right at the end, it turned to religion. I don't know how that happened. But uh, he said, well, that stuff about religion, he said, and evil spirits and that sort of thing, he said, that's just a bunch of bunk. Um, and so somebody asked the question, what about those guttural voices that come out of people? Oh, he said, that's just ventriloquism. That's just manipulation. And there were a few other questions that were asked. And, and you know, it kind of went south then. And we, we just kind of bound up the conversation and left. I guess I was actually the one to ask him about <laughs> evil spirits and speaking. Anyway, came in the next day. And I was there again. I was there early before he got there, or before the class came in. And he came over to me, uh, wow, it was far from me to you, and he said, you know, he said, uh, I thought about what you said, because that other thing you said about uh, superhuman strength, he said, you know, he says, I know, I'm, I'm being kind of cheeky when I say, well, it's just adrenaline. And, uh, but he says, I'll tell you what, he says, I don't really know. Now, the night previous, my opinion went right down the drain with him. But when he said to me, a little bit, a little bit chicken still, you know, because there was no, nobody in the classroom, but when he said to me, well, I frankly don't know. I just don't know. I don't know what to make of it. He was in the same position as a psychiatrist that wrote the article saying to his colleagues, Hey guys, are we just shunting something aside here? 
But our world deals with that today, and our world doesn't know what to do with it. And it's only going to get worse. And this is what happened to Israel, and it's coming back around. The principle that man can save himself, Satan had implanted this in the Israeli psyche. They, they were filled with this idea of being able to do certain things to gain the approbation of God and most of all, their salvation. But in the days of Christ, we're told, the leaders and the teachers of Israel, they were powerless, powerless to resist the works of Satan. They were neglecting the only means by which they could have withstood evil spirits. And it's interesting that she identifies it this way. The only thing by which, not just false doctrine, etc. She's saying evil spirits. The only way they could resist evil spirits was by the word of God that Christ overcame the wicked one himself. That's the way Jesus did it. Those who turn from the plain teaching of Scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit, oh folks, this, is, this should put us as members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church on notice big time. Those who turn from the plain teachings of Scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit are inviting the control of demons. And I'm hearing things today regarding the ministry, my ministering brethren, and the rank and file of the church that are taking the scriptures, the word of God, and turning these things and making them something that they are not. Not taking it as it is plainly stated it was demonstrated before the universe that apart from God, humanity could not upli be uplifted. So a new element had to come in. And with intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. So at the very time that the fullness of time had come, with the state of things that had developed, the unfallen worlds are watching this, and Jesus has told them what he's going to do. He's going to step down into our world in the fullness of time, in the disguise of humanity. He's told them this, but they're watching to see, because of this, the nature of things and how bad it is, they're watching to see Jehovah arise and sweep it all away. That's where the unfallen worlds are in their thinking and their wondering. Satan had a plan. He had a plan. He was, he was pushing God and hoping that God would become completely frustrated with this whole thing of humanity and just give up on it. And when God would do that, Satan was prepared to step in. It says Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness impossible. And had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proved true. He had a plan, and he was waiting for God to fail. He'd been working to make the gulf deep and impassable between earth and heaven. By his falsehoods, he had emboldened men in sin. It was his purpose to wear out the forbearance of God and to extinguish his love for man so that he would abandon the world to the satanic jurisdiction. Satan was seeking to shut out men from a knowledge of God, to turn their attention from the temple of God, and to establish his own kingdom. That's the plan that he had in mind for this world as Jesus was coming to the fullness of time. And at the very crisis when Satan seemed to be about to triumph, the Son of God came with the ambassage of divine grace. <laughs> the ambassage of divine grace. What a surprise to the evil one. And when the fullness of time had come, the deity was glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withdrawn from the plan 
until the plan of salvation should be fulfilled. And we are here at the very end of time, and that flood is still covering the land. And we're here enjoying the knowledge of it and can be joyful every day because of it. We experience this flood today, right now, in this encampment. By assuming human nature, Christ elevates humanity. He elevates humanity. He does something for humanity that he hasn't done at this point. But now we are elevated 2,000 years ago. We are elevated in this place that Jesus came to. He stepped down that we might step up. He stepped down from his throne to exemplify what humanity must do and be in order to overcome the enemy and to sit with the Father upon his throne. As the head of humanity now, Christ lived on this earth a perfect, consistent life in conformity with the will of his heavenly Father. And so he demonstrated what human nature, united with divine nature, by faith, may be able to do, may be strong and withstand Satan's temptations. What does the scripture say? For whatever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. Do we believe in overcoming? <laughs> you better believe it. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, a true Seventh-day Adventist, you believe in overcoming because the Scriptures say so. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. What does it say in Ephesians 1? We've been given all the blessings of Christ in heavenly places. Isn't that a marvelous statement? If we have everything from heaven, the graces of God to help us in this redemption process, what is there that we don't have? There isn't anything that we don't have. And that's why the scripture is so positive. Look at this from Revelation to the overcomer. You know all of these. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. No wonder that Paul, Paul could say this. Doesn't it make you happy <laughs> to, to know what God has done for us? that in the fullness of time, when he came and lifted humanity up and surprised the devil and all of his cohort in terms of what he was up to, oh, what a wonder salvation is, what God has done. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus. Well, we'll close on this one. Let your heart break for the longing it has for God. This is something that way down here late in my ministering life I'm trying to really, really come to terms with. Let your heart break for the longing it has for God. For the living God. The life of Christ has shown what humanity can do by being partaker of the divine nature. All that Christ received from God, we too may have. Thank you, Jesus. Then ask and receive with the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah. Claim for yourself all that God has promised. May that be our experience. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such wonderful assurances from your word that we have everything. You have provided us everything. You provide us salvation, forgiveness of our sin, and you've empowered us, Lord, to live for you. Oh, help us, Lord, to take all that you're offering. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your defeat of the enemy of our souls, for we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.